So I want to welcome all of you to an afternoon with afternoon. This is the 30th anniversary celebration of Michael Joyce's hypertext novel, Afternoon with Story. This event is hosted by the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Dini Grigar, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the organizer and moderator of the event and curator of the ex exhibition that goes with this event. With me today are many, 10 noted artists and scholars associated with the work and the author. And of course, Michael is here to, to read with us and to do a Q&A at the end and for us to honor him personally um, in this site. So I'm very delighted to have all of you here today. So we're honoring this work um, because it allows us to revisit its uh, contributions to literary history and situate this novel in contemporary culture. It still speaks to us today. And some of us that have been around for a while might remember that it received extremely terrific reviews from New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, um, the Earth, Whole, Earth, Whole Earth Quarterly, and a whole lot of different prestigious journals and publications. J. David Bolter um, and George Landau both you know, talked about this work extensively in their books in the early 90s. One thing that I think is really important for us to remember as we're reading through this work, that it's also the mood and the tone of this work is um, reflective of a period of what I call angst during the Reagan-Bush years. And those of us who lived through Reagan-Bush years know that it was not much different than we're living through today, except, well, same kind of issues, right? Trickle down economics took precedence over really much needed racial societal reform for racial and, and female right, women's rights, the extension of the Equal Rights Amendment at the time that guaranteed the rights of women under the American Constitution had been denied in 1981, and it would take another 10 years before the U.S. would even recognize marital rape. The character in the story Werther um, represents for us today um, the privileged white male, though his treatment of Lolly, his wife, and other women in the story are just indicative of the period and even of, of the problems we're having today. And it's the epitome of the white privileged male that, that the Me Too movement has been, um, you know, um, working against. It's about exploitation, right? Michael, um, was actually an Alinsky trained community organizer. He worked as a VISTA volunteer, building community organizations involving coalitions of people of color and working class um, white people on the Lower East Side of New York City and in East Harlem. And um, he questions in this, in this novel how American culture in the late 1980s could, could cast people of color in subservient roles both in the you know, South and urban North, decades, decades after the end of the segregation and Jim Crow laws following the civil rights movement. And his novel invites us to question why it's taken three more decades in the Black Lives Movement Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter movement to drive action against police brutality and continued racial discrimination. Um, in effect, this novel, like all classic literary works, compels us to think about and question um, the world around us reflected upon our belief systems and ideas. Afternoon, a story brings to readers both the beauty of the written word, and it's terrific, it's beautiful, the words are so beautiful, and also the pain words can cause when they reveal truths. Um, just a little bit about today's reading. We're using the 13th edition of Afternoon, a story, and this is the one produced recently in 2016 by Eastgate Systems, Inc. as a downloadable digital file. Some of you may not be aware that the first seven editions were released on a three and a half inch floppy disk, first for the Macintosh computer in 1987, and then um, later in, um, as in 1982, 1992 for Windows 3.1, which is a fifth edition. In the late 90s, this hypertext work was published as a special web edition and exerted in a print anthology, um, The Postmodern American Fiction by W.W. W. Norton and Company. When floppy disk drives began to disappear, the work then was migrated to CD-ROM in 2001. And when Apple discontinued the classic operating system, it was updated again for CD-ROM in 2007 for Macintosh's running Ma uh, Leopard and Over. The elimination of the CD-ROM drive uh, meant that the novel had to be migrated again, and it was it's recently migrated to USB stick and this downloadable dock. Uh, today, each reader are going to read for five minutes. Mm using the Zoom feature that allows them to take control of my computer. 
and we're reading from my computer. So it, um, you're going to notice that they're going to pass off their readings to each other. Following the last reader, which is Michael, we're going to have a Q&A so that you can ask questions. Just a big quick um, house cleaning, assisting in the lab today. From uh, Today is the lab team from the Electronic Literature Lab. Greg Philbrook is the tech guru and Holly Slocum is the project manager. Both of them are going to be here to help you. So if you have any trouble with accessing anything or seeing anything, please message them. Kathleen Zoller is our undergraduate researcher. She's been posting in the chat links to things for you to look at, images, links to the book chapter on Michael Joyce and things like that. So you can um, get a real good sense of, of this work. We ask any of you who have memories of the work of Michael teaching it to put that information in the chat because um, Astrid Ensign, is, who is our chat moderator, is going to be collating that information and working with me to get that information out and shared so that we have a fuller experience about what this work did and meant and, ha and still means to us today. Finally, this work is going to be recorded and archived. The videos will be uploaded to Vimeo. We'll be organizing this and putting it into clips. Um, it's going to be included into the open source multimedia book, Rebooting Electronic Literature, Volume 3, that's coming out at the end of the month, end of August, excuse me. The chapter on Afternoon Story is incomplete, but we put a link to it so you can see images of the floppy disk and all these different things for you today. So just keep in mind it's not finished, um, but we are making this available for the public just so that you know, you can get a sense of this work. The sound will be um, taken by John Barber, our sound artist and made into a podcast that would be put on SoundCloud. It's also going to be in the book and also um, available for all of you to use through um, uh, the website that we have for the, lab, for the lab. Finally, I encourage you to go to the exhibition and see the information about the 13 different editions. It um, took a lot of work to put that together, and Terry Harpold and Matt Kirschenbaum um, were very helpful in providing the information for this, so thank you both for that. Without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to our first reader, who is Jane Yellowlees Douglas. I try to grow, recall winter as if it were yesterday, she said, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents Beset by fear, and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oats exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thunder off thundering off far ice. This was the essence of what these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says without emotion, one way or another. Do you want to hear about it? I rather enjoy the blankness, the succeeding fumes like glass slides in a lantern show. I walk briskly, nothing touches me. I know why you would not want to know. I sit here unable to dream. For a full days now, everything is at a remove. All the world in rut and the pollen everywhere, so thick we sweep it up into shovels like useless grain. I may be allergic to walnut pollen, Wart says, as we sit detached by the restaurant air conditioning, thinking of what to say. I dream of white tigers in the hours of the day, the first hour when Vivaldi plays on the gold radio and the sun is a sheet of noiseless fire. But it was different when we lived in our suburb. No one sat on the chemically treated desk decks outside their landlocked homes. No voices drifted from the double-paned windows. There was only the whirring of the central air units, as if the whole development were a stealth bomber laboring to rise up on a hundred engines. She never understood when I would want to shut the air down, open the windows, and make love. Still, sometimes, at least until the end, she would humor me, knowing how I loved the feel of the sweat between us, the slap of belly to belly, the taste of salt on her thighs, cooling in the still air. It reminds me when we we're in love. She would look sad when I said these things, but she made no protest. 
While I lay there, she would pad slowly to the bathroom, scrub her belly and then between her thighs, douse herself with floral powder, pull the cotton gown over her, shut the windows and turn the air on again. And now I'm going to turn it over to Stuart Malthrop. I felt certain it was them. I recognized her car from that distance, not more than a hundred yards, yards off along the road to the left, where she would turn if she were taking him to, to the country day school. Two men stood near the rear of the gray Buick and a woman in a white dress sprawled on the white wide lawn before them, two other men crouching near her, another smaller body beyond. In the distance coming toward them and the road along which I passed, there were the insistent blue lights of a sheriff's cruiser and a glimpse of what I thought to be the synchronized red lights of the emergency wagon. It was like something from a film, blow up or the red desert. Against the sterile horizons, sometimes broken by pastel to gray-brown smokestacks, an occasional oblong of bright red, the pure ennui of the industrial landscape, not unlike the absent-mindedness of these characters' lives, also broken by occasional passion. Albers, say, or Werther. Our lives shot through with color, dazzling orange and electric blue veins, within which poison gases and the incessant thumping, beating, chugging. Uh, okay. One click would have done. <laughs> we used to get high and watch the same scene again and again, you know, when they blow up that Frank Lloyd Wright house and everything tumbles across the screen in slow motion fragments, washing machines, <laughs> don't do that, <laughs> stereos, bread, furniture, televisions, and blenders, hundreds of objects all exploding into pretty fragments, a shrapnel of possessions. Sh I'm sorry, that just reminds me of the last time I moved. A shrapnel of possessions <laughs> showering in slow-mo over our dreams of money and sex. We'd laugh and clap and ooh, and sometimes cry because it was so sad to see all those dream things go to waste. Pop art, arrow. Oops. There we go. You're thinking of the Death Valley film, the one he made in America. You see, you've confused the name with the scene where things explode. He picked a boy and a girl who had never acted before to play the lovers, and when they fucked in Death Valley, they rolled through a dust of borax and alkali, the whole landscape like ashes, but everything writhing with naked bodies. The open theater. I still don't remember the name of that volcano, Joe Chaikin. All the women have offices and we all have machines. People seem less and less apt, less able to remember. That's not true, I swear. It is simply that there is more to know now. All these indices pointing somewhere and the thing becomes a web, imagine. Feel the vibration as something snags itself and then crawl tortuously, expect expectantly out to the margins. It is like music when you write like this, all the interconnected notes, the counterpoint. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, she says brightly. There, I knew I would remember. She leans against a white plaster wall. It turns slowly pink. I'll do one more. Let's see. Let's try. Shouldn't you be certain, she asks, more exact? How so? Pupa or seed pod, when you mix the images so you dilute the vision. And the banner, too much, really. It was something very primitive, you see, nothing less than a clan surrounding a ritual godhead, or perhaps a mastodon, she says with a small smile. I will turn this over now to Kate Hales. The trees here are gods. It is the Nordic temperament. Just listen to Tapiola. A god of wood asks so much less of us than one of flesh and under the right circumstances, comforts equally. All we ask is some blankness to give ourselves to. After that, fire is its natural voice. When it is cold enough, perfectly, incredibly cold, the trees moan and roar all night. And in summer, ha! Then it is all sex with them, seeds by the thousands, the air full of sex, spermy, light, and the scent of pollen everywhere. 
they assert their ascendancy, trees do. Just look at that place out west. What's its name? Mount something or other, where the volcano sheared the mountaintop. They grow in moon dust there, in the sterility of ash, don't you see? You could call me Gila, she says. What shall I call you, I ask. Nausicaa, she says calmly. Everything rhymes. You think of me as brown, not ice, I said. Had a wife once used to love me in the heat, called me lover as porpoises in the dog days belly slap and salt. Quietly the pale moon cup, the texture of a hidden thigh, the silken arrangement of limb, and the close-cropped clover. Attitude de genunet sur la herbe du accident, sprawled like the tongues of iris or <coughs> orcas, hooded ladies' dresses, ivory light, crimson line like silken thread, the men dreaming of moisture, heart throbbing like a hidden wren. We inquired afterwards about the Tama River in Noda and the stone of Oki. At the famous Su du Matsui, at Matsuyama, a temple has been built. Graves dot the interval between the palms. The most intimate promises of lovers made never to change have made their outcome in these graves and the thought made time seem crueler the narrow road through the provinces, Basho. I try to recall winter. Once I saw a group of snowmo snowmobilers by the side of the road, off perhaps a hundred yards in what, in spring, is often a dark jade lagoon, a meadow of oats. They stood as if posed, all but goggled, all in helmets, nylon jumpsuits, and foam-injected boots, watching helplessly as the snowmobile, snowmobile burned in the snow before them. It looked like nothing other than a black chrysalis, or perhaps a milkweed husk, the emergent wings, the seeds spawn, yellow fire flapping like a banner. And now I'll turn it to John McDade. Shouldn't you be more cert shouldn't you be certain, she asks, more exact? How so? Pupa or seed pod. When you mix the images so, you dilute the vision. And the banner? Too much, really. It was something very primitive, you see, nothing less than a clean surrounding a ritual, a clan surrounding a ritual godhead. Or perhaps a mastodon, she says with a small smile. The trees here are gods. It is the Nordic temperament. Just listen to Tapiola. A god of wood asks so much less of us than one of flesh, and, under the right circumstances, comforts equally. All we ask is some blankness to give ourselves to. After that, fire is its natural voice. When it is cold enough, perfectly, incredibly cold, the trees moan and roar all the night. And in summer, ha, then it is all sex with them, seeds by the thousands, the air full of sex, spermy light, and the scent of pollen everywhere. They assert their ascendancy, trees do. Just look at the place out west. What is its name? Mount something or other where the volcano sheared the mountaintop. They grow in moon dust there, in the sterility of ash, don't you see? You could call me Julia, she says. I'm sorry, I say. I didn't hear you. It's Mount St. Helens, I think, she says. I remember there was this dreadful movie on television about an old man who stayed up on the mountain with his dog. I cried and cried despite myself. What shall I call you, I ask. Nausicaa, she says calmly. Everything rhymes. You think of me as brown, not ice, I said. 
Had a wife once, used to love me in the heat, called me lover as porpoises in the dog days, belly slap and salt. Quietly, the pale moon cupped the texture of a hidden thigh, the silken arrangement of limb, and the close-cropped clover. Attitude de la déjeuner sur l'herbe, de un accident, sprawled like the tongues of iris, orcus, hooded ladies, tresses, ivory light, crimson, line like silken thread, the men dreaming of moisture, heart throbbing like a hidden wren. We inquired afterwards about the Tama River in Noda and the Stone of Oki at the famous Suno Mutsuyama, a temple that had been built. Graves dot the intervals between the pines, the most intimate promises of lovers made never to change have their outcome in these graves and the thought that made time seem crueler, the narrow road through the provinces. Basho. I'll do one more. All the women have offices and we all have machines. People seem less and less apt, less able to remember. That's not true. I swear it is simply that there is more now to know. All these indices pointing somewhere and the thing becomes a web. You feel the vibration as something snags itself and then crawl torturously, expectantly out to the margins. It's like music when you write like this, all the interconnected notes, the counterpoint. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? She says brightly. There, I knew I would remember. She leans against a white plaster wall. It slowly turns pink. And I'll turn it over to Walter Vanini. I try to recall winter. Once I saw a group of snowmobilers by the side of the road, off perhaps a hundred yards in what in spring is often a dark jade lagoon, a meadow of oats. They stood as if posed, all begoggled, all in helmets, nylon jumpsuits and foam injected boots, watching helplessly as a snowmobile burned in the snow before them. It looked like nothing other than a black chrysalis or perhaps some milkweed husk, the emergent wings, the seed spawn, yellow fire flapping like a banner. See if we can leave this. Again, <laughs> the trees here are gods. It is the Nordic temperament. Just listen to Tapiola. A god of the wood asks so much less of us than one of flesh and under the right circumstances comforts equally. All we ask is some blankness to give ourselves to. After that, fire is its natural voice. When it is cold enough, perfectly, incredibly cold, the trees moan and roar all the night, and in summer, ha, then it is all sexed with them, seeds by the thousands, the air full of sex, spermy light, and the scent of pollen everywhere. They assert their ascendancy, trees do. Just look at the place out west, what's his name, Mount something or other, where the volcano sheared the mountain top. They grow in the moon dust there, in the sterility of ash, don't you see? You could call me Julia, she says. I'm sorry, I say, I didn't hear you. It's Mount St. Helens, I think, she says. I remember there was this dreadful movie on television about an old man who stayed up on the mountain with his dog. I cried and cried despite myself. What shall I call you, I ask. No seeker, she says, she says calmly. Everything rhymes. You think of me as, as brown, not eyes, I said. Had a wife once, used to love me in the heat, called me lover as purposes in the dog days, belly slap and salt. Quietly, the pale moon cupped, the texture of a hidden thigh, the silken arrangement of limb, and the close-cropped clover. Aptitude de la déjeuner sur l'herbe d'un accident, sprawled like the tongues of iris, orchis, hooded ladies' tresses, 
ivory light, crimson line, silken thread, that men dreaming of moisture, heart throbbing like a hidden wren. <laughs> We're on a loop. We inquired afterwards about the Tama River in Noda and the Stone of Oki. As the famous Sue no Matsuyama, a temple has been built. Graves dot the intervals between the pines. The most intimate promises of lovers, made never to change, have their outcome in these graves, and the thought made time seem crueler. The narrow road through the provinces, Basho. And let's see. A truck like this is the noiseless sutra of the machine essence. That sucker can crawl up mountains, slide down streams, and walk in pines. Put a winch on the front, and you can zip the horizon shut or drag stars back to camp. In the city, it floats above sidewalks. America has forgotten the value of a good truck. It keeps the mind from wandering. And I'll do this last one. I felt certain it was them. I recognized her car from that distance, not more than 100 yards off along the road to the left, where she would turn if she were taking him to the country day school. Two men stood near the rear of the gray Buick and a woman in a white dress sprawled on the white lawn before them. Two other men crouching near her, another smaller body beyond. In the distance, coming toward them and the road along which I passed, there were the insistent blue lights of a Chevy's cruiser and a glimpse of what I thought to be the synchronized red lights of the emergency wagon. It was like something from a film blow up of the Red Desert. And I'm turning up to Mariusz Bizarski. I try to recall winter as if it was yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon light freezes again across the black into crystal octopi and palms of ice. Rivers and continents beset by fear. And we walk out to the car the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon. The shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering of far eyes. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. Do you want to hear about it? She had been a, a client of Bert's wife for some time, nothing serious, nothing awful, merely general unhappiness and the need of a woman so strong to have friends. It was all very messy, really, for they did become friends, Lori and Nausicaa, a very early 80s kind of thing when you think of it, appropriately post-feminist and oddly ambiguous, therapies and clients, Lori's not so scrupulous professional bounds already stretched by herbal tea after each and every session, each and every client, easily became friend and friend when someone, they are neither sure who, suggested they stretch a 5 p.m. post-session tea to supper. Vegetables, doubtlessly, Vert smirked, telling me, stressing each syllable in his approximation of the German. She needs to know real woman, the silver bubble sways in his earlobe with his fervor. She should have been a beautician, he recalls. Uh, Lolly studied at the Young Institute after med school. I know he hates how much money she makes. Or a gynecologist, gynecologist, I ask. He likes this and doesn't see any irony. He thinks instead I'm getting into the spirit of it. I'll admit, he says, she hasn't been the same since she had her womb ruined. It was worse when she first went into practice. Then she used to take showers with all of them. It was some sort of 
malodorous and blasphemous baptism back then, hugging each other up tit to tit. I decide to provoke him, and an uh, occasional dick, I ask. Sounds like some jealousy here. Jealousy, jello pussy, he says wonderfully. You don't understand, do you? Lolly hates men. I think her last male patient was during the first year of her residency, and she bit his dick off. And you, I say, want to see the scars, he says. Still, it was messy. When Nausicaa left her husband, Vert hired her. And so, on the one hand, he felt some mystical and lofty attachment to her, as if she were linked to him uh, through Lolly. It was a loyalty, almost like incest, flash of his wife's flesh. Although she was my age, nearly old enough, she said to have given birth to him. I think sometimes he thought of her as the daughter. On the other hand, he wanted her for himself, as if in some dim way he and Lolly contended for her love. Then, when I began to see her, he was at the same time both jealous of us all and certain that we each knew secrets kept from him. And I will turn, turn, uh, turn it over to Anna right now. I try to recall winter. As if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt, freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice. Rivers and continents beset by fear, and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon. Here, there is a catch place, a low wire fence along a ditch which snatches what the wind wafts. Among candy wrappers, newspaper pages, and oak leaves, there are children's school papers, evidently blown free from the knapsacks and backpacks of the children from the county day school, some who walk along this road on their way home. Most of the papers are old and water-stained, dried by the sun into yellowing things. There is a fresh white paper with my son's name upon it, and red markings from a teacher. It is a report on Louis XIV, and his looping handwriting makes me weep. It begins, I am the Sun King, said King Louis the Fourteenth of France. I remember seeing a film, one of those wondrous B films, which sometimes can surprise you on the cable movie channel, in which Peter O'Toole plays a delightfully mad scientist who devotes his life to attempting to clone his dead wife from the cells of a preserved brain. I think it not inconceivable that in some future time, when gene splicing has played out its inevitable course, it should be possible to create much in the way that one now videotapes a child's first steps or high school graduation, a semblance of what that child or any being was once in the past. I have in mind a non-sentient, transitory creature, nothing more than memory embodied, yet infinitely sadder than handwriting, photograph, or the preserved sound of another's voice. She startles me there at the fence line, a woman wearing a silk dress and running shoes. Can I help you? She asks, and I want to embrace her. You from the insurance company? She asks. I see nothing. She knows she has nothing to fear from me because we are in our uniforms. She, her Reeboks, me, my J press khaki suits and taffel loafers. We kept talking about anchoring devices. It was a foundation sponsored conference on interactivity. In this case, video disc soap operas. It was my first such journey. 
the place where, probably, I got the notion of the crystal bowl of candies, for there was such a thing there. At any rate, this film semioticians or structuralists or whatever kept talking about anchoring devices. It began to dawn on me that they meant things like the titles in silent films or the screens. I came to know them. We became friends, me and these California film, film theoreticians. J. Preston Brooks Brothers function also. Reeboks are more transitory. C. Bart, or better still, Cheever. He is the master of anchoring devices. T. Triste Tropique. A. Apple. M. My name. My name. N. E. X. U. S. Nexus. R. Retro. Retro. S. X. Groundless enthusiasm. Or Grimshi. Elements of fragments, fiction, fiction fragments. And I'm now turning this over to Maria Engberg. I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, that I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the black top into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear, and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in the series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. I want to say I may have seen my son die this morning. This would be too dramatic for me, although not for Werther. He enjoys death in the abstract. For instance, how when he drives this Japanese truck of his, sometimes his eyes will turn steely and he will grip the wheel in a definite line, resisting road and emotion both, hardly breathing, eyes to the vanishing point along the road crest. Practicing, he says, and veering. Lest sometime an animal cause an accident, I drive through imaginary beasts, raccoons, muskrat, deer, snakes and crows. It's sort of insurance, he laughs. I had a friend once. He knocked against the steering wheel while drinking coffee on the way to the station at Westport, swerved into the oncoming lane, and that was that. In a bimmy, no less. Somebody said that at the wake. He'd be alive still if he'd had the station car. Wasn't used to the clearance in the, in the bimmy. My wife said she thought I'd be willing to die for my coffee too. But that was in Connecticut in those days. He asks slowly, savoring the question, dragging it out devilishly, meeting my eyes. How would you feel if I slept with your ex-wife? It's foolish. She detests young men. I feel vaguely ill all day in this heat, my ankles burning and the color of my madras cotton shirt heavy as a yoke as I sit here, unable to dream. Four full days now, it has crouched over us, the humidity like the exhalation of tigers, scratch of tough leather across the piss-damp concrete, and yet everything is at a remove. Each morning I wake, my ears filled from the draining sinuses, all the world in rut and the pollen everywhere, so thick we sweep it up in shovels like useless grain. I may be allergic to walnut pollen, where it says, as we sit detached by the restaurant air conditioning, thinking of what to say. Have I mentioned that he's younger than I? 
It isn't something I think of, though I think it fair to say it's something never far from his mind. I felt certain it was them. I recognized her car from that distance, not more than a hundred yards off along the road to the left, where she would turn if she were taking him to the country day school. Two men stood near the rear of the gray Buick and a woman in a white dress sprawled on the white lawn before them, two other men crouching near her, another smaller body beyond. In the distance, coming toward them in the road along which I passed, there was the insistent blue lights of a sheriff's cruiser and a glimpse of what I thought to be the synchronized red lights of the emergency wagon. It was like something from a film, blow up or the red desert. Against the sterile horizon, sometimes broken by pastel to gray-brown smokestacks, an occasional oblong of bright red, the pure ennui of the industrial landscape, not unlike the absentedness of these characters' lives, also broken by occasional passion, Albert say, or Werther. Our lives shot through with color, dazzling orange and electric blue veins, within which poison gases and the incessant thumping, beating, chugging. And I will turn over to Matt Kirschenbaum. I always confused them. You are thinking of the Death Valley film, the one he made in America. You see, you've confused the name with the scene where things explode. He picked a boy and a girl who had never acted before to play the lovers, and when they fucked in Death Valley, they rolled through a dust of borax and alkali, a whole landscape like ashes, but everything writhing with naked bodies. The open theater. I still don't remember the name of that volcano. Joe Chaikin. All the women have offices, and we all have machines. I try to recall winter. Once I saw a group of snowmobilers by the side of the road, off perhaps a hundred yards in what in spring is often a dark jade lagoon. Shouldn't you be certain, she asks, more exact. How so? Poopa or seed pod, when you mix the images so, you dilute the vision. And the banner? Too much, really. It was something very primitive, you see, nothing less than a clan surrounding a ritual godhead, or perhaps a mastodon, she says, with a small smile. The trees here are gods. It is the Nordic temperament. Just listen to Tapiola, a god of wood. You could call me Julia. I'm sorry, I say, I didn't hear you. It's Mount St. Helens, I think. She says, I remember there was this dreadful movie. What shall I call you, I ask? Nausicaa. Everything rhymes. You think of me as brown. Had a wife once, used to love me in the heat. Called me lover as porpoises in the dog days, belly slap and salt. We inquired afterwards about the Tama River in Noda. A truck like this is the noiseless aura of machine essence. That sucker can crawl up mountains, slide down streams, and walk in pines. I felt certain it was them. I recognized her car from that distance not more than a hundred yards off along the road to the left where she would turn if she were taking him to the country day school. Two men stood near the rear of the gray bunk and a woman in a white dress sprawled on the wide lawn before them, two other men crouching near her, another smaller body beyond. In the distance coming toward them in the road along which I passed, there were the insistent blue lights of a sheriff's cruiser and a glimpse of what I thought to be the synchronized red lights of the emergency wagon. It was like something from a film, blow up or the red desert. 
And I will turn it over to Heather Mallon. No, seriously. How would you feel? I would like to know this. The jelly-filled hard candies in the crystal bowl or on the, ta- on the table are, curiously, the same wrapped Polish hard candies. Vert keeps in his office. For a moment, I wonder if he has requested that they serve these to him here, perhaps because we lunch here so often. Then, of course, I realize that the opposite is true. He has seen this here in summers and appropriated the ritual for himself. I have been employed here three years now, lunch with him over three summers and never made this connection. I have an appalling inattention to such details. The pineapple candy is sickeningly sweet in this heat, and yet I need the energy after a lunch of salad. Would you like to make a bet on something, I ask. Mine's longer by a full inch, he laughs preposterously. No, seriously, I say. He nods. I am boring him. He would rather consider the probabilities of one of us sleeping with the other's wife. How likely is it that I might see her view it given any morning on my way to work? That depends on whether you followed her here or stayed her with her the previous night or... He wants me to ask what? Who, I say. Whom, he says. A writer should know that. Whom are you concerned about? Her or him? The lady or the tiger? Why didn't you just turn your car around and see if it was them instead of worrying yourself to death? I was afraid to see. You can never be afraid of that. Not in this business. Insurance or poetry? Love, he says. The waitress brings around a pot of of water processed decaffeinated coffee. She is very blonde, very tan. Yes, please, he says. And when she bends to pour, he says, nice tits. Pardon me, she says. Vert steals a glance to see if I have laughed. He has done this to delight me, I know. It is cultish and vulgar, and he means in this fashion to cheer me. The chit, uh, check please. Thanks, love, he says. I think I should slap him. Instead, she meets his eyes, measures him with a gaze. Then she moves away from the table. Her walk seems to show more grace than she has before. You're rude, I say. You're really rude. But I say it in the way men talk, young men, not the way of someone of means would say so. It is very difficult to use the word rude seriously, don't you think? The same is true for clever. The notion of cleverness is a class distinction, much like draperies. And yet he has given me a means, if no end. We live, or did live, comfortably, and my child, our son, attends the country day school. And so when I call, I am shunted, as all divorced parents are, to the assistant headmaster, a woman who insists on this cross-gendered title. Most likely, one suspects, because she thinks I am no one's mistress, and among whose tasks it is to handle the delicacies of parent-school interactions with the non-custodial parent. Hello, darling, she says, and when I have de- when I have identified myself, she's a bit mad, given to long floral print, print skirts and those pseudo pseudo Britishisms. Quite right, bloody hot, toodaloo, a bit of a boss. I can't say as I have, she says, when I ask if she's seen my son today. Be a dear and let me ring the secretary's office on the other line. I am a dear and I wait and listen to piped Brahms on, on the public radio station to which holding lines are linked. I try to think what I will say when she locates him, as she doubtlessly will, playing with his Montessori blocks and doing ciphers or having a go at a creative moment or lolling at his own little computer. I imagine him frowning over the keyboard, dressed in flannels and a starched white shirt. It's absurd, of course. These kids wear jeans or, in weather like this, confetti pattern jams, brightly colored California beachwear for the modern child, and t-shirts with a Coca-Cola logo. And it is my great honor to now hand this over to Michael Joyce. Now, promise me you won't raise a fuss, she says, but no one's quite certain just what happened. I, I trust you called Lisa's office. 
I would raise a fuss, but I haven't called my wife's office, which is quite against the rules for how all this is supposed to be done. I want to know what no one's quite sure of. I lie and say, Lisa was in a meeting. Miss Assistant, Headmaster sighs as one imagines a relieved dowager might. That's lovely then, she says. Most likely he's off with his form on an exploratory jaunt. We used to call these field trips. Oh, oh well. I'm going to go back. Lisa's secretary hates me. Not with, but without passion. She merely hates me. I attribute it to the fact that we were separated the weekend of her wedding. It was there Lisa met her Desmond, the half-blind musician who currently gropes her somewhat misshapen yet endearingly globular breast on those weekends when I have Andy. She isn't in and she hasn't called, the secretary says. But she'd call if she had an accident, wouldn't she? That obviously depends, doesn't it, she says, sensibly enough. I have phone calls, she says. I tell her I do also. Yuck. I would have asked her to transfer me to you hospital or children's, but part of me does not yet want to know. And now, having talked to her, another part wants to be the first to know, or rather, to be accurate, wants to know before I alarm her, lest I am wrong, and Lisa forever ridicules me because I've needlessly been protective and condescending. Instead, I ask her secretary to transfer me to Desmond's office in music. A little sad because I'm now too anxious to enjoy the little jolt of satisfaction and liberality I usually feel each time I ask my wife's secretary to transfer me to my wife's lover's office as if the whole university were an obscene and inbred tribe of fools I ride above a crystal, on a crystal stallion. In place of the satisfaction, there's a shocking sound of my own swift and shortened breaths and my pounding heart and my earphones as I wait first for the call to patch through and then for the muffled and civil, civilized electronic rings of the university switchboard. He answers the phone as if he's announcing an encore. Desmond Leary, he says. Nothing else. Most times when I hear him say this name, I feel giddily fraternal. You poor bastard, I want to say. Isn't she just a riot, using her favorite term for anything witty with which she uh, does not understand? I imagined him squinting as he tries to position the phone, squinting likewise, trying to moor himself between her wonderfully muscular thighs while she sighs like water. A half-blind classical saxophonist and professor of theory, rebound lover of the world's most stubborn woman, whom my son calls this man Larry. Fear makes me less fraternal. It's me, I say. Do you know where I can find Lisa? Oh, hello, he says, at her office, I imagine. I've already tried there, I say, without adding, obviously. Of course, he says, well, then I'm afraid I can't say. Can't or won't, I ask. It's paranoid. And I flatter him, fluster him. Really, he says, I, I'm quite sorry. Bad choice of words, I suppose. I'm sorry. I can't help you. Last I know, she was on her way to Andrew's school and then to work. Why? Then you saw her this morning. Did she have her purse? Really, he says. I'm not after anything. I say, I just want to find out where she might have gone. Doesn't make any sense, I know, but I do not want to explain that I want to know if she carried identification. Anyway, even as I ask it, I realize the question is mad since they'd look up the registration on the car if she weren't able to respond to them. Then just as quickly, I realize that they wouldn't necessarily call me since the car is registered to her in the newly edited name, which removes her from her utterly except in the flesh of Andy. I'm going to leave off there. Um, maybe uh, in honor of Janet Murray, who for years held a, a very interesting <laughs> enmity toward me. And, and once, once I asked her, well, what exactly was the problem, Janet? And she said, y you never tell us whether the boy lived. And so I told her, oh, for sure he lived, even though I'm still not sure myself. Um, I want to thank all of you, um, panelists, participants, uh, uh, attendees, for um, being here today. Uh, but I especially want to thank Dini. Oh. I, went, I went out of screen share so we could see everybody's faces. Okay. Well, get, did everybody hear all that before? 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I especially want to thank Dean. I thought you, I thought you'd move the screen around. Just when I was going to thank you, Dean, um, who's first of all for the en enormous logistical struggle to put this thing together, but secondly, uh, for that remarkable curator's um, statement, which is just profoundly moving for me and utterly the essence of what Jerry McGann meant when he talked about the kind of bibliographic work. Uh, Jerry, who's also who Kate's uh, for, former colleague and, and Matt's mentor, uh, when he talked about the kind of work we'd all have to do to preserve uh, whatever this is that we've all crafted together. Um, before we go to the question and answer and, and to shut me up, I do wanna thank a few other people, uh, some of whom I may be among the attendees, I haven't been able to see everybody, uh, but who absolutely deserve the deepest thanks. First of all is J. David Bolter. None of this would have happened without J. David Bolter. Remarkable humanist. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I agree. Me too. A remarkable humanist, a remarkable person, a great friend for all of uh, my professional life. The second is the mother of us all, Nancy Kaplan. This also wouldn't have happened without Nancy Kaplan. Uh, Tinek and, and all of the things that came about as a result were uh, really under the umbrella that she laid out for us. And she's the one who kept uh, John McDade and Stuart Mothrop and I in line when we started the <laughs> Idiot Boys and watching television all the time. Um, and then I do want to thank Rolf Krause, whose name came up, who is the Emeritus Professor of American Literature uh, from Hamburg University in, in Germany. The way the logistics of things like this went, uh, Rolf probably should have been among the readers and things just kind of got lost on us, but I was happy to hear that he and Dini have been in, in uh, contact throughout all this. And last, but absolutely not least, I want to thank Carolyn Geyer, uh, who continues to sustain me in my uh, artistic and professional and personal life. Dini. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. It's been a joy putting this together with you. When I reached out to you about this, <clears throat> there are a lot of reasons why I, want, I wanted to do this, folks. First and foremost, trying to keep these works um, circulating and aware, you aware of them. Uh, Mark has done a Mark Bernstein has done a yeoman's job trying to keep these in circulation for these thirteen editions. Just when something starts to work, um, Apple comes around and changes things and he has to re reformat everything. So it's been it's been a very difficult um, process of keeping all these works alive. So these 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 traversals, these performances help a lot. On the second hand, the reason why I wanted to do this is to celebrate this particular work because it is considered the granddaddy of hypertext fiction and the one that gave birth to the field to hyper hypercard, I mean hypertext, you know, literature and those kinds of things that we think of today. Um, and then finally, in the middle of all this pandemic, I think most of our spirits were flagging a bit. A lot, um, losing people, people were sick, dying, suicide attempts, things like that that were happening all around all of us. And I felt like a celebration was in order to remind us about the important things in our world. And that's the things that we produce as human beings. Human expression lies at the heart of everything we do. This is so valuable. And putting our, our, our energy into this, this beautiful work and all the work that many of you um, here, all of you artists and scholars, produce is important and it gives us some sort of energy to move forward through all of this. So let me ask the first question, then I'm gonna turn this over to the Q&A, which I think we have some questions here. So Michael, I'm, first I wanna say, um, Arno, thank you so much for running through that piece that you did that showed the word, the single word fragments on the page. Because my first question to Michael is about that very thing. And that is the fact that there's this feature in the novel that it almost presages animated poetry at a time when it wasn't quite that easy to do. And we see these fragments moving on the screen and there's, I, I counted three different um, portions of this in the various link, you know, um, spaces in the hypertext. So do, I want to see if you can speak to that idea of these animated works, these poems, little tiny fragments moving. Um, in this fictive um, narrative space. Yeah, thank you, Dini. Uh, uh, it, it's an area of afternoon that isn't often talked about. Uh, it's one that's very dear to me, um, even though I joked about maybe being stuck in the middle of all those fragments and, and all of this. I, I'm, I'm not going to do, uh, especially with 
Kate and Matt and several others on, on, on this um, panel. I'm not going to do the history of all of the, the kinds of kinetic and animated literatures that came through modernism all the way down, you know, from the futurists down to BP Nickel in, 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 in very early uh, computer systems. But for me, and let me just, I'll talk about why I moved to that. Um, I was aware from Cummings, from Pound, from lots of ways about uh, the, the kineticism of, of, of text on the page. And, and I talked in the earliest days about afternoon about thinking of the links as not really as later theorization and rightfully criticism came to kind of question and challenges that going from here to there, but sort of as a gestural interface, a sense of caressing the screen of bringing things out and what have you. And that was part of what led me to the kind of kineticism of, of, of those sections of the text. Um, early on, and I've, I've talked about this in, in uh, numbers of people who first moved to hypertext, Carolyn's among them, uh, 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 Jane uh, Yellowish Douglas, uh, many people talked about having a feeling of, of, of what we now understand as kind of materialist understanding of what the computer screen was doing and what have you we saw analogs in textile art and in, and in visual arts and collage and what have you and uh you know while well i can't claim a kind of intentionality about it i was surely surely influenced to move by those things yeah i, I what i did is i videotaped it so i videotaped myself going through that and then i made a video showing this movement it's really quite interesting to see it in that format, um, I'll, I'll be putting those links online for people to see you know, in the uh, book. The other question I have is this is considered serious hypertext. That's, that's the, that was a moniker for- Well, Mark's online, Mark's online, that's a trade style too, right? <laughs> it is, absolutely. And it is a very serious story. You know, a man thinks he sees his son you know, die. And, uh, and the story's about, you know, coming to grips with that and trying to figure out the, you know, solve that mystery and coming to some sort of understanding about it. And I didn't really care to know the answer to that. Unlike Janet Murray, that living that in the air was important part of the story. But that said, there's also this comic element to the novel. There's a playfulness about it. And as you're reading through the 500 plus Alexias, we only read through a, few, a very tiny bit of it today. And then we kept repeating in the loop. We come across um, your allusions to like um, John McDay's Uncle Buddy's Fun, Fun uh, Phantom Funhouse and Alexia called Lost in the Funhouse. We also see you uh, make an allusion to Turing's Man, which was Day David Bolter's book, and then you refer refer to you and Bolter as Sean and Shem in the Alexia called Twins, and then you refer to River Run, which was the name of the company that you and and Jay and um, John B. Smith were, um, you know, had, had, had you know, developed story space in. You mentioned story space. So do you want to speak to some of these more comic, playful elements in this, in a very serious story? Yeah, I mean, you of course touched on them um, in that last set of allusions, uh, directly Joyce and believe it or not, um, you know, it's a burden and, and, and a pleasure to be a writer named Joyce um, at, at the stage where I became a writer. Uh, but, but when you look at the sorts of things that James Joyce brought to the novel and that, and that modernists in general brought to the novel, there was a sort of carnival quality to textuality in which the things that move us most deeply also can move us, especially Irish Americans or or Irish in general, to, to um, a grim sort of comedy. Um, and, and so it was a natural sort of thing to move toward. Plus, I really was in a context of, of people that later became Tinek and, and, and all of the people online here who really saw screens as having a full range of emotional uh, uh, tenor uh, of um, from, from the very comic, you know, to, and we live in it now, the mimetic and, and what have you falls right in the middle of the tragedy of the Trumpian regime and all of those sorts of things. Um, and, and so it was quite natural for me by genetics, by literary history, by the people around me, by having grown up in a huge Irish American family where uh, in, the, in the middle of uh, a, a funeral of her, her own father, my mother would say, I don't want to have your damn crying either. Um, it was the way we grew up, the way we came to language. 
We have some questions from the audience. I'm looking in Q&A. I'm not seeing anything there. Quite, people have been talking quite a bit in the chat. Um, Astrid, would you? do you have a question you want to ask, perhaps? I, I have so many questions, but I've, I've also been following the, the chat here avidly, as you can imagine. Um, and I'm really getting a sense that this is only the beginning. So my, my suggestion would be to move this this lore chat um, to the Discord, if that's something people would like to do. Because I think there's so much more to talk about. And then for people to ask questions, there, there are generations of scholars and people who've never been able to read afternoon, right? Um, so may maybe, I mean, Michael, do you have a tip for the newcomers? Um, if they do manage to get their hands on a copy or, you know, um, an online version, like where, where to start? Um, where to start? Can I interject? It is available. Um, so yeah. it's available. Mark is, is still selling it on, on USB and downloadable for Macintosh. So if you, I encourage you to read the novel um, and contact Mark. I, I, I try to give Mark a heads up that there might be folks contacting him for this. So Mark, let people know it's, that you're um, still making it available. And I'll step back and let Michael answer. Well, I, I, as, as always, right from the first, the first time that I ever read Afternoon, which really involved sort of standing at a lectern while people told me what to click on a screen and then reading what happened. I, I'm less in a position of offering tips than having found from people today remarkable readings. I know reading, you know, I mean, that's, that's just a, a, a crafted work of art of somebody who has a deep sense of, of the work in ways that I don't. Um, Kate Hale's uh, uh, remarkable reading of after uh, remarkable reading of everything electronic and and uh, in print, but her remarkable reading of afternoon taught me so much about uh, about, about areas of reference and parallelism and what have you that I would have seen that that I wouldn't have seen without them. I mean, that's the hope we have, isn't it? That that um, you know, I've had to keep my eyes from watching this chat screen um, roll over here, but in, in my teaching life and, and in my online life, um, as in most of yours, the, we, we all just follow these impulses, the, the clicks and the moves and the what have you. Um, I, I would say, but it was wonderful. We all ended up in that loop today. I was afraid that we'd be there for an hour and then everyone <laughs> would have left. Um, but it does remind me of very early on, my friend Howard Becker, uh, uh, great sociologist and, and one of the earliest supporters of all this, uh, who had a, a beta as early as the ones that John McDade and, and Yellow Leaks talked about, um, called me up one time from San Francisco where he was living and said, I've been reading this goddamn thing for two hours. When does it end? And I said, I'm pretty sure it's over for you, Howie. Um, <laughs> one tip would be if it, if it loops, at, as it says in the directions for the reader, if it loops, go back to the start as so many people did earlier and 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 move off and, and and that's probably all I have to offer but great question Dina Larson thank you Dina Dina has three questions but let's start with the first one Michael can you talk a bit about the beginnings of afternoon and the impetus for merging the meaning of the guard fields within the text and you may need to explain to people especially folks that are creating twines what a guard field is I, I, I saw flick flip flipping by that Bill Bly has a better definition than I do. <laughs> but I mean, guard, guard fields are really a kind of rudimentary uh, um, logic system um, that that was just this brilliant inspiration of Jay Bolter's that allowed us to really check in the way of you know, game machines and what have you, where people had visited, but also to, uh, to build very complex kind of logical structures, uh, almost gestural structures out of uh, decisions that people made about what they'd read or where they were going. And and those become combinatorial. They're out of the writer's control or out of, in story space at least, out of the writer's control at a certain point, deeply enough into it. And I think that's what the loop we were in. Uh, every time people would bring up that screen, we'd followed all the links and it didn't know a way out. And so it was over in the Becker sense. Mm -hmm. um, but um, now I'm forgetting what, what, what uh, Dana's question was. Because, oh, how do we merge them? Um, you know, we, everything that people often would ask me, what, you know, where are the printed drafts of afternoon? What did you do? You know, do you, do you have any of those documents? 
there were no such documents. We wrote, on, I wrote on screen. I say we because sometimes I would need a structure, a, a link structure, a logical possibility or something, or I'd need to understand the logical syntax. And I'd be on the phone, no email, with, with Jay saying, what about this or what about that? But um, pretty much the merging came as part and parcel of the story. The story, um, you know, I don't know if I've ever said this before, and I was thinking about it today when I looked very quickly at the text. Um, you know, there's an actual, there's an actual uh, inspiration for the novel, and that was that long time ago when I was teaching at community college in Michigan, uh, and and married to Martha Petrie, a wonderful writer and teacher, uh, and uh, she was taking my son to the daycare center, and a colleague of mine who was a, a speech teacher, a communications teacher, called me at home and said, uh, "They are both okay." That was the first words he said, but there has been an accident. And um, they, it was a fender bender and, and there were no papers along the fence or anything, but that really prompted mm -hmm. that moment. And th that, that prompt spawned a whole network of possibilities. Many of them logical, many of them illo illogical, many of them elusive. And, and maybe that was the, the motivating impulse of uh, of of the integration that Din Din is talking about, yeah. So uh, there there are there is no manuscript, as you say, Michael. But there there are some receipts, yeah, as we say nowadays, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and those, of course, are at the the Ransom Center at UT Austin, where your papers are are archived. Um, a couple of things. I, I was there many years ago, many afternoons now to look at them. Um, but some things that I, I do recall, and I was just looking at those old notes again, uh, there is, for example, a newspaper clipping um, from a local newspaper in Michigan with the burning the, snowmobile uh, <laughs> and the yeah. burning snowmobile. Yeah. So that, that's another sort of concrete shard that exists as a point of departure for the text. And then there are also, there are three pages of sort of schematics, if you will, where you have notes and um, a kind of almost notational language that you seem to have evolved for describing different nodes and their relationships. Um, one of which, one of those three pages is stained with a coffee cup ring, <laughs> which really, you know, for the researcher in the archive, that's that moment of proximity, the, the whiff of vellum that we all crave in the archive. Here it was a coffee cup ring on a schematic <laughs> diagram of some of the nodes in afternoon, but just a kind of reminder that those material traces of the text do uh, persist and are nowadays gathered in a quite specific location. Yeah. People, Thank you me. might want to, if you haven't seen uh, Matt Kirschenbaum's book, Mechanisms, he does an incredible job um, working through story this story and um, chapters you know, devoted to it. You know, it's history, background, all this information he's talking about now. Please get that book. There's also an article called Editing the Text. All of that is located on the resources for the exhibition page, um, the website that we've made. So please look at his book and look at his article. Yeah, and I, I, just let me say that um, if from Yellow Lee Douglas on to Matt and uh, and Kate and and now Dini, um, even before I was uh, having all the senior moments with my memory, <laughs> they have really re reminded me and sometimes recreated for me a, 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 the past and the present of the creation of the text. I do want to add too, and Matt knows this. There. Are, there are two other little schematic fragments that I sort of held back. I think that maybe in Xerox at Ransom, but that um, the actual holograph um, I'm holding back for my two kids, <laughs> just stuck in a file so that at, at the appropriate time they can have those. There's a wonderful question here um, from Kirill. He's, a, he's new to our community, so I'm glad to see him here. And thank you, Kirill, for asking this question. You say, I have a question about how do you think play, wordplay, modern, uh, postmodern play of discourses, et cetera, is transformed into game with more or less strict rules and perhaps the possibility of failure, puzzles, et cetera, and hypertext works? What a marvelous question. Mm -hmm. um, 
play, you know, in the one of one of the we only hit the Basho version of it, but um, there is a sort of anthology sequence in 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 this sort of beloved predecessors and Renzinger's uh, um, work on play and on games was there early on for me, as was the kind of counter pressure Stuart and, and John could jump in here. I was the badass who always said, oh, no, this isn't a game. Stuart corrected it theoretically several times in a row. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, but, but, you know, it was my own short-sightedness, not really understanding that what later became gaming, uh, computer gaming, uh, has its roots in, in kind of high modernism or earlier than that, but, but sort of linguistic gaming, uh, the kind of thing you're exactly talking about in this question, how a, a set of, of structures or rules, in fact, also generates misrules, uh, spontaneities, possibilities, uh, variations, unexpected variations. Um, I, I suppose all of that finally evolving uh, in the evolutionary schema in Quidditch but um, which is a terrible joke, but um, nonetheless, yeah, I mean, I came late to this particular um, um, show, dragged kicking and screaming by, first of all, my own children who are now grown men, a doctor and a lawyer, but then by McDade and, and, and uh, Mothrop, and, and then little by little by little by little by students up to the very last uh, class that I taught, taught at Vassar, when this wonderful young man from uh, China showed up uh, with a deck of cards that he was shuffling saying, here's the Vassar campus and this, you can play this just like uh, a video game um, and, and then dealt them out in front of me like somebody reading, um, you know, um, my fortune. So um, these are things that I had to learn from all of you. The next question in here was given by Aiden Walker. Hi, I asked uh, earlier in the chat, what do you think about the relationship between the hardware and hypertext and what writing a hypertext for a desktop computer like afternoon versus a smartphone might mean or look like? Uh, I, you know, it's, it's a great question. And it, it's something I, th I think of constantly in the same way I talked about earlier, um, being a prig about word processors. I remember being equally priggish. Well, actually, uh, um, the whole bunch of us, the first TNEC people were on one end of, maybe Stuart or John can remember who this person is, fairly famous novelist who wrote, without using our names, but in the New York Times saying, nobody's going to ever want to read a twitchy little screen. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and I thought, well, you know, the Macintosh the shape of an ice block was seemed to be what she meant. And, but I thought to myself, well, nobody's ever going to want to read anything on a phone. And, and, and I, I remember uh, eating that crow pretty early when um, Diane Balestri, God rest her soul, who was an early uh, voice in this entire movement uh, became the, uh, the head of um, the academic computing at Vassar and said, uh, what should we do? for the future here. And I said, uh, understand that the telephone's next and that, that didn't make me a prophet. That made me somebody who was just running behind the train. To get to your question, um, I, I, the issues of how to write for multiple formats, which m people much more informed than I on, on this panel have addressed, uh, not just theoretically, but practically, Stuart being maybe the premier uh, uh, writer in multiple uh, media and multiple materialities, but there's a whole group of people here. Um, it, it's, I, I feel humbled by it. I don't know what I would do to write for the phone or for Twitter or for whatever. Uh, I, uh, but, and yet I, you know, I for years pointed out to students and reminded myself, we all write our own story every day. And I'm not just talking about, you know, Facebook um, um, pages or what have you, but we, we all do write a combination of emails and, 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 and various social media uh, uh, versions of who we are. And we somehow put them together in a way. And some of us, some of you uh, do that in, in, in a way that um, takes on a, a medial life of its own. One of the things we're doing in the lab is these traversals. This is something that Stu and I started back in 2013. And we notice a phenomena that when we do these group readings, um, the, the, the students in my, in my program who are younger, um, 
become really interested in electronic literature. They love the hypertext novels when we read it together as a tribe. Mm -hmm. So that part of what we're doing here is reading this together as a tribe and being able to hear each other's voices and experience the, um, the sound of the words, which gets lost when we're just reading it to ourselves. So we're reinventing um, the love of literature through these reading experiences. We'll be doing more in the fall. I'm hoping that Carolyn Geyer will let us do tri uh, quibbling in the fall. Um, we're go going to also do Sucker and Spades, which is something, an uh, older work, 1988. Um, I'd love to do Election of 1912, Mark Bernstein, um, and, you know, works like that. So we're going through all 48 works that I have in my catalog in my library to make sure that these have been documented and we're doing these group readings. And, and, and this environment seems to work okay for it. I mean, this we were able to do this uh, today quite deftly, I think. We have another question, uh, one more question perhaps. Jeremy Height's second part. How do you see works now moving into new searches for rich text experiences like yours beyond works more fragmented and in interactivity, but working in AI? And thank you. Wow, Jeremy, these, these questions <laughs> are the, the um, I, I, you know, when, when Bob Coover and others started to explore the cave, um, VR caves and what have you. I thought that was maybe the way that this kind of richer textuality is going to make its way. Um, but then Maria Ungberg and, and Jay and I started doing some work in, a, in augmented reality, and I really came to believe that something that that I you know at, 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 I wrote at the end of Twelfth uh, Blue, but you know everything can be written, you know, and you you can go chase that down. And, it, it's like a, a Catholic litany of all of the surfaces of the world that can be written on. I suspect the answer to your question is some combination of uh, artificial intelligence and augmented reality, uh, but also one that s starts to invoke uh, what Dini just pointed to, what we've all experienced together, the, you know, the shared mind that is imprinted along all the surfaces of the world that we interact with, and in some way can sample and 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 uh, mix them and present them to us in the ways. And you know, this may be a, a remarkable moment. I'm, uh, I'm sure there are people sitting here filled with Zoom illness at this stage <laughs> in any hour, right? Um, but we are learning something new that um, you know the better theorist among my fellow participants can point to, but this is this whole pandemic process is something other than social media, something other than augmented reality, and maybe writers are going to bring themselves to it in the way that, and I didn't, I'll end on this one almost, in the way that Kate Hales long ago pointed mm -hmm. out that the print book was totally, completely in, in, infused with and interpenetrated and woven with electronic textuality in a way that we now see a second nature. Uh, print pages can do all these things. They can leap into different surfaces and whatever. It may be that whatever this shared, uh, uh, um, the, the, this shared isolation that we create into community uh, is, is the next step and what it will take for the full dimension of the language that you're questioning asks us to think about. Thank you. Jeremy Hyde has a two-part question. This will be our last question from the audience, and then we'll have some, complete, com some concluding remarks. So Jeremy's question is, curious about the germination of the work. Were you first fascinated with pushing past possibilities in storytelling or of new tech conceptually? Um, and as a writer, did you first have a concept of the text that was really resonating? Yeah. Um, it, at the risk of repeating something, it's become an almost ancient anecdote, but it's true. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think I had an inherent fundamental sense that any novelist had, and I'm, I'll try to shorten this anecdote, but w back in the day, you had to type out things, and, and then when you made changes, you retyped them, and then along came this wonderful thing called the word processor, and you realize that the kinds of changes you made were something that showed up on page 200 and something really belonged on page 15 was a completely questionable notion. 
What do you mean it really belonged? It, it, it belonged in 200, but you're now saying to yourself, well, I can put it on 15. And then you start to understand that the text has all of these potentialities in it. And it, almost immediately when I got a word processor after being the norm, not normal, abnormal kind of priggish English professor that said, I remember saying to a colleague who showed me a word processor, oh, what does it do, mix up Hollandaise? Um, that that I came to understand that it was not only the, the salvation for any novelist, but it was this multivalent, completely open, uh, unbelievable uh, uh, set of, of affordances as we've taken to calling them. Um, but, uh, and, and I instantly wrote and, and sent an email to, uh, uh, didn't instantly, I had to hunt around to find anybody working on this, but wrote to a marvelous woman named Natalie Dane, who was then with Roger Shank at the Yale AI lab and working on what was called story generation. And I sent her a letter, again, not an email, saying, I'd like to you know, uh, find some computer program that would allow you to write a story that changes every time you read it. And she wrote back and said, well, that's idiotic. You're wrong. That stories depend on having made choices. <laughs> and, 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 and if you do that, you'll, it'll be the end of stories. And thankfully, <laughs> um, she and I worked together at uh, the LAI lab, and at, but even before that, she said, you ought to talk to this one guy who's as nuts as you are, this J. David Bolter, and he wants computers to tell stories like Homer did. And that's how we found each other. That's great. Just to remind everybody, this um, story space software and that Michael, Jay, and John produced, um, and this work, after the story, was first demoed at Hypertext 87. So part of the celebration is coming back to Hypertext Conference to do that and then putting it with the ELO community because this work helped to give birth to our field. It's such an important time to come together with these two communities. And it speaks to the tear down the walls theme that Klaus Asenbuch back um, introduced last year for Hypertext uh, 19. So, you know, just keep that in mind. And I encourage you to go back to ACM Hypertext Proceedings and read the the, um, the material on this work that is printed in the um, in the proceedings. Eighty nine also has some good articles, so please look at that. Um, we should have some concluding remarks. I want to thank um, e the ELO community and ACM Hypertext community for supporting this particular event. Uh, Anastasia Salter, thank you so much for allowing us to have this time to have a hundred people here and to spread the love of this work and to keep it alive and and into the into the moment. And then I'd like to turn it over to Michael for any concluding comments. I made my con concluding comments along the way in media res. I am profoundly moved by, uh, first of all, this group of panelists, translators, friends, uh, scholars, uh, thinkers, but also to uh, the list of you scrolling there and on, mm -hmm. on, on this sidebar. Um, mm -hmm. I promised myself I would not cry. And so I am going to say thank you. I love you. This was wonderful. Thank you. And for those of you interested, please look at the exhibition. It gives you detailed information about the 13 editions. Also, the chapter on Michael Joyce is coming out this summer, but it's available. Um, preview right now. Keep, keep it, give me grace on it not being totally finished, but you can start to see what, what we're doing. And there's a traversal there that James O'Sullivan gave at my lab several years ago when he was visiting. And it's a, he's got an Irish accent. It's beautiful work. And he sends his regards today. He couldn't be here because he's doing a um, DHSI event in um, Cork, Ireland. So I want to thank the readers today, all of you, all 10 of you. That's Jay Yellowlees Douglas, Stuart Malthrop, and Catherine Hales, John McDade, Walter Vanini, Mariusz Porosky, Arno Renault, Maria Enberg, Matt Kirschenbaum, Heather Malin, and of course, Michael Joyce. Thank you so much for the time you put into this. Um, thank you everyone who came today. It, it heartens me to, to see so many people um, love this literature as much as we all do. Have a good afternoon, enjoy the conferences. I'll see all of you at ELO 2020 and those of you who are hypertext, I'm still with you. Love to you all. Goodbye. Thanks, Deanie. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.